Hello folks, welcome to this new video. Uh, this one's a little different than the last couple of videos I've made which have been more instructional in nature. Uh, a couple about using a sextant for celestial navigation in Flight Sim. And the last one was looking at the uh, flight dynamics of the, the Milvis Beaver here that just came out a little while ago. It was a little bit of a test flight sequence. This one's different. This one is just for fun. Um, just because I have been having such a blast with the Milvis Beaver. and. Uh, thought I'd document a little bit of it. So you can think of this one as a day in the life of a bush pilot. And uh, as you can see, we've woken up to better mornings <laughs> as a bush pilot. I'm using uh, real world weather and uh, near Ketchikan, Alaska right now. This is what it looks like. So the sequence today is that we are uh, we're going to play the role of a standard charter bum bush pilot in southeast Alaska flying people and cargo around in a beaver and we are in our uh, our Milvis beaver in the Alaska forestry colors on amphib floats. Most of what we do today is going to be water landings as a matter of fact I think they're all water landings. So I'll show you the route here. This is Ketchikan, Alaska, in southeast Alaska. Interesting place. You can see the town is here. What you can't quite see is that there's a channel that cuts the town off from uh, the Ketchikan International Airport, which is the airport that gets airline service in this area. And uh, folks from the town actually have to take a ferry over to the airport. It's kind of cool. But so this is water here, and you see the anchor symbol. This is, a, uh, this is the Ketchikan Harbor seaplane base. We are starting out west of there on this island, which is Gravina Island. And this inlet right here is called Bostwick Inlet. We are at a fictional scenery location, the only fictional, fictional location we'll be going to today. The rest all exist in real life. But we're at a fictional location right here at the head of Bostwick Inlet called Misty's Place. And it is a uh, return to Misty Moorings scenery location. And it's kind of the unofficial base of operations for flights around the Misty Moorings world down here in southeast Alaska. It's got a gravel strip. It's also got a uh, seaplane base component. As you can see, we're parked right down here. We could take off on the strip today, given that we have uh, amphib floats, but we're going to go ahead and taxi into the water over by that dock there. There's a nice seaplane ramp. And you notice they were thoughtful enough to include lights on the channel markers all the way out to the water. And we'll make a water takeoff out past that uh, that lighthouse. So our first hop is empty from Misty's place. We're going to hop right around here and we're going to duck in through this channel and land right here in Ketchikan and tie up to the Ketchikan Harbor seaplane base where we're going to load up with uh, some passengers and cargo bound for the Misty Fjords Wilderness Area, which is this whole area up here. And it's an absolutely spectacular area of scenery. Cruise ships on their way up southeast Alaska come in here and they poke in the Rudyard Bay and the Punch Bowl and all that, and they, uh, they show off the scenery. It's a great area. The U.S. Forest Service actually runs quite a few cabins and shelters in here that you can rent and go stay in for a week. And uh, the only way up here is to charter either a boat or a seaplane, so most folks fly up here by seaplane. And, uh, and actually most of the cabins we're going to can only be reached by seaplane. There isn't, uh, there isn't boat access either. So we're going to take off out of Ketchikan Harbor. We're going to stay over the water and stay low probably considering uh, the weather pretty lousy today. We're going to come up the Beam Canal here. There's a little geologic oddity up here called New Eddystone Rock. If we have time we'll circle that. I'll tell you about that uh, as we get closer. And we're going to come up here into Rudyard Bay, which is one of the iconic uh, fjords in Misty Fjords National Monument. First thing we're going to do is come up this arm of Rudyard Bay, which is called the Punch Bowl. We're going to fly up the Punch Bowl. We're going to hop over a wall here into Punch Bowl Lake. And while it's not charted, there is in real life a U.S. Forest Service shelter right there. And it exists in the uh, Orbex Pacific Fjord scenery. I'm not sure if Orbex put it in or if it's a return to Misty Moorings location. More about that later. But we're going to uh, drop some cargo off here. We're going to pick up 
a U.S. Forest Service employee that's been uh, doing some maintenance work on this shelter. We're going to take him back down through the punch bowl, further up Rudyard Bay, up this way into Nuya Lake, into the basin here and land in Nuya Lake, and uh, drop off our Forest Service employee at the Nuya Lake shelter to do some maintenance. We're going to pick up the folks who are staying in the Nuya Lake shelter. They wanted to do a two-cabin vacation along with a couple other folks on the list, so we're going to run them from Nuya Lake on up through here, and then we're going to climb a bit up to Big Goat Lake, which is a little bit higher up. It's almost 2,000 feet in elevation. We're going to go into the Big Goat Lake shelter right here, and we're going to drop off our current passengers at Big Goat Lake with some new supplies. We're going to pick up the folks who are currently at Big Goat Lake. We are going to fly them down, and I do mean down. This will be one of the more striking parts of the flight. It's down a pretty good cliff down here to Wilson Lake. And uh, again, it's not charted, but there is a cabin up here at the head of Wilson Lake, and we're going to take uh, our folks and drop them off there. Then we'll fly an empty leg just down the length of Wilson Lake here to the Wilson Narrows cabin, which is another real U.S. Forest Service cabin. We'll pick up the folks who are there, and we're going to take them back to Misty's place with us. They have a guided hunt scheduled on Gravina Island tomorrow. So we're going to run down Wilson River to the head of Wilson Arm here, where right here at these two rivers, there's another misty mooring scenery location called the Wilson Lake Lodge. We'll overfly that. We won't land. We'll continue on down out Wilson Arm, through the water, or over the water, I should say, and we'll probably again be staying low because down here in the more marine areas, the ceiling's very low today, and uh, we're going to duck back into Misty's place. That's our mission for the day. And I want to show you that again in Google Earth, just because if you aren't familiar with Return to Misty Moorings, I think people don't understand just what they've put together over there. So here we are. This is Bostwick Inlet, Misty's place right here. This is our starting and ending point. Okay, You can see that all these icons here, I've got a KMZ file activated that shows all the Misty Moorings scenery locations. So they've got a little yacht club. There's a story behind all this stuff. And you can see there's all these cabins on here. The deal with the cabins is that when Ormex made their scenery. They included quite a few of the U.S. Forest Service cabins, but they also omitted quite a few. The good folks that returned to Misty Moorings put all the missing cabins in and they charted them all for us. Up here in Ketchikan, you see they've got some additions to the Ketchikan International Airport. They've also got a Ketchikan Harbor edition. It's not even charted, but we are running it. And all these other sceneries. And uh, if I zoom out, you can see just up here in the Misty Fjords area, look at all the cabins that they've added, and here's our Wilson River Lodge. But now, just for effect, I want you to keep in mind that every icon you're seeing is a freeware scenery location that someone has set up at Return to Misty Moorings. They're all a whole bunch of fun to fly into if you like bush flying. I'm going to zoom out now. Those are all Misty Moorings scenery locations. From southern Alaska, and heck, now they've, they've actually added the, pli the pipeline all the way up to the North Slope. But look at the concentration of scenery locations on the Kenai, all the way down southeast Alaska, and fairly deeply into British Columbia as well, as you can see, all the way down the coast into though it's a little sparser down here, but they are extending their reach into the uh, Pacific Northwest Orbex scenery. Those are all freeware locations. Now you need the underlying Orbex scenery to run them, or they won't fit correctly, but look at that. That is hundreds of freeware scenery locations. I, I just can't say enough good things about the folks that return to Misty Moorings. They run a heck of a great operation. Alright, now that we've seen that, because my computer's already struggling to run all this, we're going to close Google Earth. Back to the task at hand. We need to get going. It's dawn. We have a long day in front of us. We're going to leave Misty's place at Bostwick Inlet. We're going to fly around here. This is the first leg. It's a short hop into Ketchikan Harbor. Pick up our passengers. Now, as you can see, the weather is not good at all right now in southeast Alaska. Uh, I haven't checked it because well other than Ketchikan, which I have checked, and it's actually 600 broken and 2 miles visibility in Ketchikan right now. Uh, so even squeaking in VFR is a little questionable, but we're going to give it a try. Technically it's not 
legal, but eh, this is not uncommon to fly this way in southeast Alaska either. But I don't know it, how far into Misty Fjords we're going to make it today. All we can do is poke up there and take a look, and, uh, well, that's true-to-life bush flying, isn't it? I've got the, uh, the sim paused because I didn't want dawn to get away from us. I wanted to take off near dawn. That's why the raindrops are paused. But I think that covers all the preliminaries. So, why don't we get going? Or not. There we go. <laughs> My computer is uh, struggling to run this all today with the, the weather conditions being what they are, and the detailed scenery and the, and the detailed airplane, and don't let that reflect poorly on the, the airplane or the, the scenery, it's just, my computer's just not up to snuff for this. But anyway, let's get going. The first thing we're going to do is load up. We're using FS Captain today to simulate our uh, charter flights, and we'll go ahead and load up real quick, do a normal load. Looks like we're going to load two passengers. I know I said this leg would be empty, but, uh, well, frankly, I, I was a little bit too lazy to set up all the loads in the FS Captain flights to match up exactly what we were planning. So I'll just let it load us with random loads, and at least the airplane will, uh, will weigh different, different, uh, weights for every flight. Okay. We're loaded up with our two passengers for the lengthy flight all the way to Ketchikan Harbor. Doors closed up. We'll go with the manifest load. And we're clear for departure. All we have to do now is start moving and it'll take care of that. So, we are ready to crank up our trusty beaver here. that sticky switch problem that this airplane has sometimes. It's related to frame rates, and since I know my frame rates are low today, we'll probably see a good bit of that. Uh, if you have a uh, better performance computer than mine, you would not see that problem with this airplane. Alright, fuel system's pressurized. Burning out of the full tank. Mixture's rich. Pumps on. Mags are hot. Clear prop. Well, that was a neat glitch. Don't think we need the cabin light, but we'll get the radios on. We will get some instrument lights on. But not that bright. There we are. Hmm, <laughs> was that thunder? <laughs> well, we'll see how far we get today with this weather. mode. I will load up my flight plan real quick here. And I'll set up the autopilot. I am going to use the autopilot on these flights, and I know uh, some folks would consider that heresy in this kind of an airplane, but gives me more time to look around, and with the weather being what it is today, uh, we'll take all the help we can get, really. The last thing I want to do is tune in an NDP. There it is. 396 is the Clam Cove NDP over at the Ketchikan International Airport, which is not exactly where we're going, 
but it'll be uh, helpful for situational awareness for sure. NDP is difficult to tune in this airplane, or the ADF, I should say, is difficult to tune in this airplane. Uh, there's an update that Novis has coming out really any day now, and I'm hoping it addresses that. Oh, come on. Okay, there we go. That is enough of that. Let's get going. Flip the landing light on. Nav lights as well. Crack just enough carb heat to make sure we stay in the green because with today's conditions, carbizing could definitely be a concern. model of this airplane is steered purely with differential braking. There really isn't any uh, steerable nose wheel situation here, which is actually pretty accurate for this airplane. Well, really, for, for air flip floats in general is what I mean to say. Alright, so if I remember right, there is a ramp over here. There it is. And we can get ourselves into the water here. I also remember this ramp being very bumpy and, uh, I want to take it real slow. But you do want to keep moving. Come on, girl. doesn't look like it will work, but as long as you stay between the lighted markers, it usually does. Boy. You know, I did not plan the weather. Uh, this is really what it looks like in southeast Alaska right now. Definitely an atmospheric day to be a bush pilot, huh? Alright, we'll turn out to the left of the lighthouse there. You can see the uh, seagulls circling around the lighthouse. You can hear them as well, probably. They're fun to take off out of the uh, dirt strip and fly past that flock of seagulls on the way out. Definitely was thunder. <laughs> yeah, it's an atmospheric day for sure to be a bush pilot out here. Alright, let's see here. Our gear is up. We will get our strobe lights on. We'll turn our pedo heat on today as well because uh, both this airplane and FS Captain model pedo tube I say. And uh, we don't need any of that today. And considering the thunder we're hearing, I'm going to go ahead and crank up the, uh, the Milviz weather radar too. About two degrees. 
degrees up for the altitude. We're flying on a workout pretty good. Looks like some rain showers in the area, but not too much in the way of heavy conductive activity. All right, altimeter set, DG set. Let's set the attitude indicator because we definitely could end up in a little bit of IMC today. Although that is not the plan, of course. We're going to stay low. We'll level off about 500 feet. Try to stay VFR underneath these clouds and get on over to the Catch Can Harbor. And here we go. Water rotors are up. We're upon step quick. We are relatively light with only two passengers and one tank of fuel. down there is pointed uh, about at a 330 bearing to the station and that's about right. You can see the smoke plume from that other cabin I was talking about right there. At this point I'm going to go ahead and turn the autopilot on to nav mode and altitude mode. I think I was a little bit to the left of my line, hugging the island, we do want to widen out a little bit. If we check our GPS here. Yeah, you can see we've just made that right turn to get back to our uh, line here, which will take us up the channel into Catch Can Harbor. I'm flying the uh, the panel version of the Beaver without the GPS installed because, A, it's an older panel and I, I like it in this airplane. B, it helps uh, 
my performance a little bit on my computer here, especially when I'm recording in lousy weather. And really, to this day, there's there's plenty of airplanes like this running around southeast Alaska without any panel-mounted fancy avionics. You know, these days, most guys are using an iPad or something with four flight on it. So we'll just go ahead and say that our pop-up GPS simulates that, though it isn't quite as nice as four flight. Boy, we have some lower clouds out here, don't we? And you'll notice all the uh, the flashing light navigation markers here on the water. You see that these are for boating, and uh, yeah, I believe they came with the Orbex scenery. But the neat thing about them is they actually mark navigable boating channels. Well, you cannot even see the Ketchikan International Airport today. It should be over there. And our north here. Those might be flashing lights for it, but the sun glare isn't helping us. Alright, I'm going to start slowing us down because we are making our left turn into the, uh, the channel there. This is the town of Ketchikan off the nose. This is a really detailed scenery area, hence the, the micro stutters of my airplane, or my uh, computer. Boy, visibility is coming down in here. Some cruise flaps out. And I'm going to turn the autopilot off. Start easing on down. If I remember right, the uh, seaplane har dock in the harbor is just past the area where the cruise ships park. Let's hope there's some cruise ships in port right now. So uh, I have a landmark. The cruise ships do move around, and I'm Honestly, I'm not sure if that's Orbex or if that's Misty Moorings, because I know there is a Misty Moorings add-on that adds a lot of uh, shipping traffic. Alright, I think that is a cruise ship just off the nose there. Landing flaps down, and we want to land just about to meet the cruise ships. Again, just a low and rainy day, and while Ketchikan is known for being windy, for the wind actually howling through here, uh, it, it was pretty when I checked it today, so I think we'll just land straight ahead. I don't think wind direction is going to be an issue. Stutters are bad today. All right, there we're off step. Take out that back pressure. Suck the flaps up right away to get them out of the salt water spray. Water rudders are down. You'll see that little handle move below the fuel selector. And I think that looks like a cub. Yes, there's the seaplane dock right there. Let's turn some lights off so we don't blind everybody coming in, huh? Radios can come off too so we can cut the engine when uh, we're where we want to be. And we'll turn in here. I'm not sure where we want to park. Ah, here we go. We'll just go right in here. Right against those fenders, nose in toward this Super Cub. say those are our passengers and this is close enough for someone to toss us a line. Hmm, a 
bit of a freeze up here. Come on. Wow, this is, uh, that's not typical at all. Recording software must really be taxing things. <laughs> early. FS Captain gives us a score of 100%. Let's see why. Base score is 85. We are on time with no block revisions. So we got a plus 5. The passengers said we had a smooth flight. The passengers also said we had a very nice landing. Final score 100. Hey, we'll take it. And uh, we will be back for the next leg out of here and up to our first cabin, which is the Punchbowl Lake Shelter. Hello folks, okay, it took a little while for our passengers to get here. You can see it's uh, not quite dawn anymore. And we're paused again, just to not let it get too much later. Uh, we're back in Ketchikan Harbor, our next hop. And this is one of the longer legs until the return trip home. The uh, next few legs will all be very short. But we're in Ketchikan Harbor here, where you can see it's three miles missed and broken 500 right now. And uh, we're going to take off out of Ketchikan Harbor. Fly southeast. Over Mary Island, where there's a cabin charted that we may or may not see. I'm not sure if uh, either Orbex or Misty Moorings put it there. Actually, we're not going over Mary Island. This is the cabin I was talking about. Because we're going to take a left before we get down here. We're going to head up the Meme Canal. This is a lava bay. There is a Misty Moorings cabin up there. Continue up the Beam Canal. Wind Stanley Island, there's another Misty Moorings cabin right there. And this is the uh, the Beam Canal here. This is uh, one of the main cruise ship routes up through southeast Alaska. So ships come in here, you, you load this up in Google Earth, and you'll find a trail of user photos that trail into Rudyard Bay here and go up the Punch Bowl and go up here just because it's where the ships go. Uh, this right here, this little island, this is New Eddystone Rock. It's a geologic kind of an oddity. I'll tell you more about it once we get going. The Misty Moorings folks have given us a nice rendition of it, so assuming we're not running late uh, per FS Captain, we'll do a circle around and check it out. Go up here, up Rudyard Bay. The hope is that we can climb up into Punchbowl Lake. There's a cabin right there that's not charted, but it's there in real life, and that's our destination. So we're going to duck into Punchbowl Lake here and uh, pick up our employee at the cabin. And I think per FS Captain, we probably have a couple passengers and some cargo, too. I, uh, again, I didn't spend the time I should have to detail all that. But that's our route, very, uh, very common route. Plenty of beavers on floats fly this route all summer and fall. So let's get going. Load up an FS Captain again. Normal load. And what I'll do, guys, is I will absolutely put links in the uh, the description to different points on the timeline, so you don't have to watch the the whole video here because it's probably going to end up being about an hour and a half. And I know I wouldn't want to listen to myself, or I wouldn't want to listen to me <laughs> babble on for that long either. So, uh, you know, I'll put in links to the uh, departures and approaches, the various places, so you can see the the scenery without having to watch the whole flight if you don't want to. I'll go ahead and record the whole flight though, just because hey. I've got nothing better to do if you want to come along. <laughs> Alright, so we loaded up two passengers. 674 pounds of cargo. We've got some gas. We're ready to go. Proceed. A little discrepancy. We'll say the manifest is correct. We are cleared for departure. We'll start the flight. Once again, let's get going. Extra rich, prop full forward. Probably gonna have some sticky switches because of the uh, performance issues around Ketchikan here, just because it's such a detailed scenery around the harbor. She does a lot better for me once I, I get out into the bush. And uh, as I've said a million times, that's just my computer. I don't want that to reflect poorly on the airplane. Left the mags on that time. That was my fault.
Well, I wanted to slew us back, and I should have done that before I started FS Captain. In an effort not to screw it up this time, we're just going to taxi straight ahead and turn through that piling if necessary. It's a little longer flight. We do have some fuel in the uh, in the center tank, but it, not much. So we'll take off on the full tank, which is the front tank, and then we'll burn a little bit out of the center once we get going. Alt or the uh, autopilot set for 500 feet, which I think we better stick with for now. Which flight plan do I have loaded? Catch can punch bull lake. Perfect. GPS mode this time. I said I wanted to dial up the uh, Nichols NDB. What is that frequency? Two something. Two sixty six. On. Gotta turn some pedo heat on because we're gonna take off right now. More thunder nights just in time for takeoff. Strobes and landing lights. Pump the flaps down to take off. Trim's in pretty good shape. Everybody's ready. So long, catch again.
used to flying the wheel version, which is a tail dragger feature sitting a little nose high, and so I calibrated it nose, nose high, when of course in the amphib version you sit fairly low. Like I said, I'm only using the autopilot because what I like to do up here really is look around. Uh, I mean, the, the approaches and landings and the takeoffs are fun from the different bush locations, but in cruise, the scenery is what's cool. That's what I want to be looking at. Alright, FS Captain finally knows we're in the air. It thinks we're still climbing because I told it our cruise altitude is 2,500 feet. That's what we were planning for. However, uh, we're going to stop here for now, so I'm going to send the top of climb report. Dispatch likes you to check in with them every once in a while, which obviously there would not be an eight car system installed in Beaver, but you would certainly check in via VHF radio whenever you could. It's kind of a shame just how poor the conditions are. I really do hope it improves a bit as we get south and then as we get northeast of the main canal. But I'll tell you what, uh, there are plenty of days when, even though no VFR pilots wouldn't consider flying in conditions like this in most of the world, you know, the bush is a little bit different over the world. And whether they should or not, absolutely guys that fly in this kind of weather. And we took off with the water runners down again, boy. Here I go thinking I don't need checklists, huh? Alright, well we're coming up on that island that has the cabin on it. It's this island here. There should be a little pond in the middle of it. And then, uh... Okay, there's that little pond in the middle of it. There's a cabin that's charted just past the pond, near the far end of it. is Orbex and Misty Moorings both only included uh, the Forest Service cabins and other public residences, and if that's just somebody's private cabin, well, shoot, it's not going to be modeled. Ooh. What a mess, huh?
extra weight, zero pounds. Uh, hey, there we go, this building got a little better, huh? Yeah, so I certainly don't see any ice weight. Well, that's good. If we look down here at our radar, you can see we're about to get into it rain shower here. This thing really does a very good job. It's, it it uh, behaves well as a radar. And uh, so you'll see visibility come back down probably when we get in there. But the radar is getting a little, or the rain's getting a little more scattered. That's a good thing. So we're running along uh, the south end. That's, let's see here, that is Notch Mountain right there. Stays this nice, we'll climb a little bit, huh? Let's see if we can get up 2,000 feet or if we're going to regret that. FS Captain just sent us a message. What does dispatch want? Clear for approach at, uh, this is the code I gave the cabin. So clear for approach, punch ball leg, no assigned gate, no weather available at this time, clearly. FS Captain, if you guys are familiar with it, you understand it's more of an airline simulator. I've, I've found a way to emulate a bush operation with it, but obviously a lot of its really cool features don't apply to a bush operation. Assigned gates, checking runway status, checking weather for destination, telling you when it's below minimum so you can burn, because that, that kind of thing wouldn't exist in the bush, right? And so FS Captain just doesn't know those sorts of things, and that's cool. I wouldn't expect it to, and I'm glad it doesn't. What I really like about FS Captain, though, is I like the way it sends me to places that I wouldn't necessarily go. And in this case, I've specified the destinations because I know the route of flight I want to take. But so often, I just ask it for an assignment, and it sends me places. Now, you're not forced to do anything that it wants you to. You can always just reject the assignment and ask for a new one. But it is cool that you, uh, if you look at what it gives you, and you realize you've never been out that way before, or, uh, you know, you might see some scenery you haven't seen before, you go ahead and fly it. It takes me to places I wouldn't have gone just because I wouldn't have thought to. And, uh, and so it really simulates that kind of charter aspect of you never know what you might get asked to do next, right? Definitely looks lower to the north back towards Ketchikan, doesn't it? I think we're getting out of the, most of the rain here. Uh, we were supposed to get into another rain shower in front of us. Oh boy. <laughs> easy graphics card, easy. And I bet you that darker cloud is our rain shower. But we're also going to start a turn here any minute. That's, uh, that's the main canal. Alright, there's our turn. Funny because according to the radar, we flew through a, uh, a rain shower, but I didn't really see one. My other experiences with uh, this radar is that it's very good. It really does work well with Active Sky Next, and it does uh, it does show you rain whenever you're going to run through it. And right, so you see the darker clouds over there. That's this area of rain right here, out over the mountains. Our way straight ahead up the beam looks okay for a while. Looks lower once you get up there further. Might be a problem. painting much up there, though. I have the best success on about a 20-mile ring here. Okay, so that's the little bay. Let's those black squares fill in because my poor graphics card can't keep up with all that I'm asking it to do. Uh, that's a lava bay right there. And there is a cabin up there. If I jump outside...
That's the lava bay cabin. Speeton Island will be up there, and then the, uh, the Wind Stanley Island cabins up there. Wow, blue sky. Hey, hey, huh? We'll just go ahead and leave the pedo heat on for now so I don't forget to turn it on when we get into some rain. Temperature wise, we're doing okay. Shoot, it's 58 degrees up here. Of course, we haven't climbed very high, that's one reason. <laughs> Definitely looks like there may be some lower scuddy clouds ahead. I'm not going to climb this anymore. We'll stay at a thousand feet. That's right. We said we wanted to get the rest of that fuel, didn't we? Yeah, we've got maybe five gallons of gas in the middle tank. Might as well burn it. Especially in the wheeled version of this airplane, the further forward you can move the CG, the better she uh, behaves on the ground. There we go. One thing they added in a service pack at a user request that I really, really like is now when you run a tank dry, if you don't pay attention and uh, switch in time, when you run a tank dry, the engine doesn't just quit and surprise you. This uh, this light right here, which is a little fuel pressure light, can I push to test? Yeah, I can. I didn't realize that. This is your low oil pressure light here. Well, anyway, the fuel pressure, the low fuel pressure warning light will start to flicker at you. And that tells you that you're running out of gas in that tank, and it's a visual cue to switch tanks. It's a reminder. I don't know if the real airplane behaves that way, although if you have a low fuel pressure light and you start running the tank dry, I would expect that along with a little, little engine sputtering, that would, that would illuminate. So uh, it's a cool reminder that they built into the beaver here. Getting a little bumpy. island right there is charted on the sectional as uh, Rudyard Island, which is the same name of the bay we're going up, Rudyard Bay. They're not really next to each other, but Rudyard must have been a person of some consequence around here. And in front of us there is a ship of some kind, or a ship maybe? Let's see what it is. And uh, the, the ship is right next to an island called Smeaton Island. for panel elimination anymore. Let's turn that off. And you can see when you throw a control for the lights, there is a little bit of a delay before they come on or off. At least on my system, perhaps it's a performance issue. I'm not sure. I know that the, the lighting is fairly custom. It relies on some custom builders gauging. Uh, but one thing I'll say about it is uh, it looks fantastic. There's also a cabin light that you can turn on or off, and a map light, and uh, it's some of the nicest instrument panel lighting I've seen. Yep, that's a cruise ship coming down the beam canal. <laughs> and that is a Misty Moorings edition as well. Return to Misty Moorings has a, uh, an AI shipping traffic add-on that adds all kinds of shipping traffic all over southeast Alaska, southern Alaska, British Columbia, and uh, the Pacific Northwest. So, I mean, you fly around Puget Sound, you've got ferries and tankers and all sorts of stuff, and up here you've got these cruise ships. Let's go over to the side here and zoom in and take a look at it. And the ships are spectacular. The tankers, and, and they're all where they should be, you know, we're seeing a cruise ship here because this is a cruise ship. Uh, route. It's, it's a lane for cruise ships. Now, if you go somewhere where uh, you expect to see more commercial freighters, then that's what you'll see. Ferries. The, uh, I noticed flying around Prince William Sound that the, uh, the Whittier to uh, Valdez ferry runs, and I'm not sure if that's part of Morbex's scenery or if Mystic Moorings added that, but <laughs> the Return to Misty Mornings folks just, they, they put in so much cool stuff, I mean, talk about bringing this part of the world alive. As far as immersion goes, if you like being a bush pilot, but, I mean, it just wouldn't be the same without their stuff. Return to Misty Mornings is, uh, is just one of the coolest 
flight simulator. That's probably the coolest flight simulated discovery I've ever made on the internet, I think. I'm sure if you've ever done this kind of flying, I'm preaching to the choir here. But on the off chance that I'm talking to somebody who has never checked their stuff out, you really need to. But yeah, using FS Captain with, with the Misty Morning scenery, which, you know, a lot of the Misty Morning's locations do show up as airports. They're coded as airports, and so you can fly to them. FS Captain will dispatch you to them. A lot of the uh, Misty Morning scenery locations, though, are not, including all of these cabins, and so I've had to create little FCAD files for them just with a fake water runway. And uh, then, then uh, FS Captain will create missions once you fly to them. And that's cool. I don't mind doing that. When I am finally done uh, creating AFCADs for all the cabins and things, maybe I'll send them over to Mr. Moore and see if those guys are interested in putting it up if anyone else wants to use them for this kind of thing. But, uh, but FS Captain will dispatch you to a lot of little just gravel strips, farm strips, depending where you're flying. Uh, Orbex Pacific North and West, they include just a ton of private grass strips. And, and you know, you can fly around all those, they'll dispatch you on jobs to those, and that's a lot of fun. And uh, up here in Alaska, southern Alaska in particular, the region south of uh, Anchorage and southwest Anchorage, down the Kenai Peninsula and the Prince William Sound region, boy, there's a lot of great, great little gravel strips, and that's all Orbex, you know. I mean, Misty Moorings has some great additional locations there, but Orbex alone has great airports to try to land at, and I really, really like flying the wheel version of this airplane. It, it, it makes three-point landings beautifully. Wheel landings, eh, they're tricky. But takeoffs are fun, and, uh, and three-point landings are great. It is a lot of fun to try to get, get into narrow, you know, sloping bush strips. All right, so this on the right here is, uh, is Quinn Stanley Island, and so there is a cabin, but at our altitude, I'm not sure that we'll see it. Hearing some thunder again, there's definitely some more rain up there to the left. But that's okay, because we're going to go up here and take a right turn up a bit. Or is that detonation? This airplane model's detonation. I think that's what it is. It's possible to overboost the engine and cause detonation. Yeah, look at the exhaust stack and you'll see a little flame coming out of it. I think the sound loop could be a little better for detonation, but that's what that is, is detonation. Now, if it's an overboosting issue, all you'd have to do is reduce the manifold pressure a bit, but that doesn't really help much. What does help is cracking the car feed on, and it, and it doesn't take much. And this kind of weather is pretty prime for car bites anyway, so it doesn't hurt to uh, crack the car feed on. Now then, we've got decent visibility. Um, that other cabin I was talking about should be behind us a little bit. Back in one of those bays there, but I think it's probably blocked by trees from here. If we were higher or we flew over there, we'd find it, but that's okay. We don't need to, because coming up ahead, we've got New Eddystone Rock. That's right there. This is its kind of like Devil's Tower in Wyoming. It's a, uh, a plug of lava that formed in the earth and cooled and then softer rock around it eroded away and left this pillar. Let's see how we're doing on time here per FS Captain. It says we're on time. Uh, progress. Estimated in for the plan 11 minutes. We've got 9 minutes remaining, but that's within, uh, within our reach. I imagine we've got time to take a turn around New 80 Stone Rock here. Surely our passengers would appreciate it, right? And Misty Moorings did a good job. If you land out here in a seaplane and pull up to it, and just look at it up close, it's really neat. And you actually, a lot of Misty Moorings scenery locations are on or near water, and so boating is actually something fun if you have a, a boat that you like to use. So I've never tried it, but I think it would be pretty cool. I'd like to try it. They've actually got some float plans over there that 
bring you up rivers and that sort of thing. Try to be gentle for our passengers here, right? Or we'll get dinged by FS Captain. There's New Eddystone Rock. And if I were to get lower or closer, it would be even more detailed. And I think there's seagulls flying around it and everything else. But You can see one pleasure boat pulled up to it. Maybe it's a popular party spot too, I don't know. <laughs> but alright. We better get on to rendezvous with our uh, Forest Service employee up there at Punchbowl Cabin, or he's going to be waiting for us. Bay would be to the north. Why don't we try going north, huh? <laughs> I think that's Rudyard Bay right there, to be honest with you. Pilot. Okay, yep, that's Rudyard Bay. We'll go right in there. So at this point, it estimates per the plan, we'll be in in 10 minutes. For our schedule, we needed to be in six minutes. We are Gossock 654, Gossock's my little bush company up here. We're going from 5KE, which is uh, Ketchikan Harbor Seaplane Base, to uh, CZ14, which is the uh, what I named the Punchbowl Lake Shelter. Clearly, I could request uh, runway status, I could request weather. If you're going to divert, you have to transmit that. If you ever got to run into a delay, you have to tell dispatch about that. Using this with a true airline flying simulation, you know, like this PMDG 737 NGX or something like that, would be really a lot of fun. I think it would add a whole new dimension. A lot of the cool features that FS Captain brings don't work in the bush. But a lot of them do. Enhanced icing conditions, enhanced turbulence and thunderstorm uh, issues, random failures, bird strikes. You know, these, these things can happen when you're running FS Captain, and they all have consequences. And that makes it a little bit more fun. A wide range of emergencies can happen to you, and you can control how likely all of that is. Okay, here we turn into Rudyard Bay. This is one of the cruise ship destinations. Misty Fjords National Monument, and you can see that big uh, rock wall just to the right of us there. That area is called the Punch Bowl. We're going to take a right turn up Punch Bowl Cove. We're going to hop up over a little rock wall into Punch Bowl Lake, and there's a shelter up there. And that's where we're going to pick up our uh, our Forest Service employee. Well, one other thing I didn't mention, just because it was hot as hell here today decided to fly in the fall. So I'm using real world weather. The weather is uh, is what the weather conditions are in southeast Alaska right now for active sky. But the scenery, it's set to uh, October. And so as we get up in elevation a little bit, we may actually start to see some, some color. We might see some aspen trees or birch trees turning golden, that kind of thing, maybe some larches. And I don't know that there's any fall color up around Punch Bowl because we're not high enough in elevation, but I think once we get up by Big Goat Lake, we might be. Geez, Big Goat Lake freezes. I hope it doesn't freeze in October. <laughs> All right, so this is the punch bowl, and you can see the blurries on the rock wall just because, just because of my computer. But, uh, pretty famous area. You can, uh, you can go on Google Earth, and you can find a lot of user pictures up here in Punchbowl Cove. It's a popular 
seaplane flight scene destination from uh, from uh, catch cam. Uh oh, you see our, our yellow light flashing? That's our low fuel light. We better switch on to the front tank here, or our engines will make a quit on us. There we go. And we are flying just about right over Punchbowl Lake Shelter right now. Down here on the left, just past this point. Well, that's probably it right there. Yeah, that's it right there. No smoke with this one. It's just kind of a lean-to shelter, so... Oh, yeah, there are some, some aspects colored up with Miracle. So we're going to hope there's not much wind up here. Turn around and land the other way. right here. This time we'll remember to uh, paddle ourselves away from shore before we start FS Captain. Punchbowl Lake Shelter. Certainly not a uh, 
bad place to spend a few days, I wouldn't think. Do a little fishing, paddle your boat around the lake, go check out those islands. Yep, there's worse. There's worse. Let's see how FS Captain uh, scored us. Well, it said we're early. That's good. How'd we do? Alright, we have to open exits in deep plane. There's our people getting off. We got a score of 95. Twenty-three feet per minute on landing, not terrible. What's our, uh, hmm. I thought there was a way. Nope. Oh well. I thought there was a way to read like passenger comments and that, because, uh, well I know there is, because I've seen it before, but I obviously don't remember now. Alright, we'll be back.